The Restaurant at the End of the Universe by Douglas Adams. Chapter 33 A mile or so away through the wood, Arthur Dent was too busily engrossed with what he was doing to hear Ford Prefect approach. What he was doing was rather curious, and this is what it was. On a wide, flat piece of rock, he had scratched out the shape of a large square, subdivided it into 169 smaller squares, 13 to a side. Furthermore, he had collected together a pile of smallish, flattish stones and scratched a shape of a letter onto each. Sitting morosely round the rock were a couple of the surviving local native men to whom Arthur Dent was trying to introduce the curious concept embodied in these stones. So far, they had not done well. They had attempted to eat some of them, bury others and throw the rest of them away. Arthur had finally encouraged one of them to lay out a couple of stones on the board that he had scratched out, which was not even as far as he'd managed to get the day before. Along with the rapid deterioration in the morale of these creatures, there seemed to be a corresponding deterioration in their actual intelligence. In an attempt to egg them along, Arthur set out a number of letters on the board himself, and then tried to encourage the natives to add more themselves. It, it was not going well. Ford watched quietly from beside a nearby tree. No, said Arthur to one of the natives, who had just shuffled some of the letters round in a fit of abysmal dejection. Q scores ten, you see, and it's on a triple word score, so... Look, I've explained the rules to you. No, no, look, please please put down that jawbone. All right, we'll start over again. And try to concentrate this time. Ford leaned his elbow against the tree and his hand against his head. What are you doing, Arthur? he asked quietly. Arthur looked up with a start. He suddenly had a feeling that all this might look slightly foolish. All he knew was that it worked like a dream on him when he was a child. But things were different then, or rather would be. I'm trying to teach the cavemen to play Scrabble, he said. They're not cavemen, said Ford. They look like cavemen. Ford let it pass. I see he said. It's uphill work, said Arthur wearily. The only word they know is grunt and they can't spell it. He sighed and sat back. What's that supposed to achieve? asked Ford. We've got to encourage them to evolve, to develop, Arthur burst out angrily. He hoped that the weary sigh and then the anger might do something to counteract the overriding feeling of foolishness from which he was currently suffering. It didn't. He jumped to his feet. Can you imagine what a world will be like descended from the, the, these cretins we arrived with? He said. Imagine, said Ford, raising his eyebrows. We don't have to imagine, we've seen it. But, uh, but, uh, Arthur waved his arms about hopelessly. We've seen it, said Ford. There's no escape. Arthur kicked at a stone. Did you tell them what we'd discovered? He asked. Hmm? said Ford, not really concentrating. Norway, said Arthur. Slarty Bartfar's signature in the glacier. Did you tell them? What's the point, said Ford. What would it mean to them? Mean, said Arthur. Mean? You know perfectly well what it means. It means this planet is the Earth. It's my home. It's where I was born. Was, said Ford. All right, will be. Yes, in two million years' time. Why don't you tell them that? Go and say to them, excuse me, I'd just like to point out that in two million years' time, I will be born just a few miles from here. See what they say. They'll chase you up a tree and set fire to it. Arthur absorbed this unhappily. Face it, said Ford. Those zebes over there are your ancestors, not these poor creatures here. He went over to where the ape-man creatures were rummaging listlessly with the stone letters. He shook his head. Put the scrabble away, Arthur, he said. It won't save the human race, because this lot aren't going to be the human race. The human race is currently sitting round a rock on the other side of the hill, making documentaries about themselves. Arthur winced. There must be something we can do, he said. A terrible sense of desolation tr thrilled through his body that he should be here, on the earth, the earth which had lost its future in a horrifyingly arbitrary catastrophe and which now seemed to set to lose its past as well.
No, said Ford. There's nothing we can do. This doesn't change the history of the Earth, you see. This is the history of the Earth. Like it or leave it, the Golga Frinchians are the people you are descended from. In two million years, they get destroyed by the Vogons. History has never altered, you see. It just fits together like a jigsaw. Funny old thing, life, isn't it? He picked up the letter Q and hurled it into a distant privet bush where it hit a real rabbit. The rabbit hurled off in terror and didn't stop until it was set upon and eaten by a fox which chalked on one of its bones and died on the bank of a stream which subsequently washed it away. During the following weeks, Ford Prefect swallowed his pride and struck up a relationship with a girl who had been a personnel officer on Golga Frinchen, and he was terribly upset when she suddenly passed away as a result of drinking water from a pool that had been polluted by the body of a dead fox. The only moral it is possible to draw from this story is that one should never throw the letter Q into a privet bush, but unfortunately there are times when it is unavoidable. Like most of the really crucial things in life, this chain of events was completely invisible to Ford Prefect and Arthur Dent. They were looking sadly at one of the natives, morosely pushing the other letters around. Poor bloody caveman, said Arthur. They're not. What? Never mind, said Ford. The wretched creature let out a pathetic howling noise and banged on the rock. It's all been a waste of time for them, hasn't it? said Arthur. Arr, muttered the native and banged on the rock again. They've been out evolved by telephone sanitizers. Arr, 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 insisted the native, continuing to bang on the rock. Why does he keep banging on the rock? said Arthur. I think he probably wants you to scrabble with him again, said Ford. He's pointing to the letters. Probably spelt grgrgrgrgrgrgrgrgrgrgrgrgrgrgrgrgrgrgrgrgrgrgrgrgrgrgrgrgrgrgrgrgrgrgrgrgrgrgrgrgrgrgrgrgrgrgrgrgrgrg
The trees seem pointless, the rolling hills just seem to be rolling to nowhere, and the future seemed to be just a tunnel to be crawled through. Ford fiddled with his sub-ether sensomatic. It was silent. He sighed and he put it away. Arthur picked up one of the letter stones from his homemade scrabble set. It was a T. He sighed and put it down again. The letter he put it down next to was an I. That spelt it. He tossed another couple of letters next to them. They were an S and an H. As it happened... By curious coincidence, the resulting word perfectly expressed the way Arthur was feeling about things just then. He stared at it for a moment. He hadn't done it deliberately, it was just random chance. His brain got slowly into first gear. Ford, he said suddenly, look, if that question is printed in my brainwave patterns, but I'm not consciously aware of it, it must be somewhere in my unconscious. Yes, I suppose so. There might be a way of bringing that unconscious pattern forward. Ah, oh, yes. Yes, by introducing some random element that can be shaped by that pattern. Like how? Like by pulling Scrabble letters out of a bag blindfold. Ford leapt to his feet. Brilliant, he said. He tugged his towel out of his satchel and with a few deft knots transformed it into a bag. Totally mad, he said. Utter nonsense. But we'll do it because it's brilliant nonsense. Come on, come on. The sun passed respectfully behind a cloud. A few small, sad raindrops fell. They piled together all the remaining letters and dropped them into the bag. They shook them all up. Right, said Ford. Close your eyes. Pull them out. Come on, come on, come on. Arthur closed his eyes and plunged his hand into the towel full of stones. He jiggled them about pulled out four and handed them to Ford. Ford laid them along the ground in the order that he got them. W, said Ford. H-A-T, what? He blinked. I think it's working, he said. Arthur pushed three more at him. D-O-Y, doy? Ah, perhaps it isn't working, said Ford. Here's the next three. O U G do you It's not making sense, I'm afraid. Arthur pulled another two from the bag. Ford put them in place. E T Do you get Do you get shouted Ford. It is working. This is amazing. It really is working. More here Arthur was throwing them out feverishly as fast as he could go. I F said Ford. Y O U M L U No M U L T-I-P-L-Y. What do you get if you multiply? S-I-X. Six. B-Y. By. Six by. What do you get if you multiply six by N-I-N-E. Six by nine. He paused. Come on, where's the next one? Uh, that's a lot, said Arthur. That's all there were. He sat back, nonplussed. He rooted round again in a knotted up towel, but there were no more letters. You mean that's it, said Ford. That's it. Six by nine. Forty-two. That's it. That's all there is.